Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Voices of Humanity show at PRConnectionsRadio.com, the voice of new media. My name is Guy Dawson, and I am conducting a series of interviews uh, with, under the show, The Voices of Humanity, with victims of police misconduct, police brutality, and um, we've been interviewing a host of people over the last few months, and we have another person who wants to tell his story today. His name is Terry Rochaszewski, and uh, he has a really interesting story, not in a good way, by the way, but interesting nonetheless, about uh, an interaction that he had with the police in 2012. And Terry, welcome to the Voices of Humanity show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it a lot. It's a great way to get the Terry, story. Terry, will, will you tell us you, the story of the interaction that you had with the Metro Police Department in 2012? Uh, yeah, actually, I moved here uh, with my partner at the time in 2012. And uh, I had moved here thinking that I was going to be working at Lake Mead uh, National Park because um, at that time I was working for the National Park Service and they had budget cuts. And of course, uh, my my number was up. And so I got my my uh, job loss. So I had been applying for jobs and I had just got a job at Nellis Air Force Base um, to work in the security forces um, section. And. Uh, basically, we went out to uh, one of the pools on, you know, the, on the strip and kind of had a little uh, celebration because finally I was going to be working again. And uh, everybody wanted to go out uh, to the clubs that night um, to keep on the celebration. But I had to get up early because uh, my day was going to start at 430 in the morning. So I ended up going home um, and. I was still kind of, you know, amped up, uh, not only because I was going to be working the next day um, and the next day was going to be a lot of training. So it's going to be a lot of play and um, a lot of, you know, um, learning the, new, the job, playing with the new toys, things like that. So I was I was pretty amped up and I just couldn't fall asleep. So um, I, at the time I had a uh, bug bite. Um, Vegas is pretty, pretty hardcore with bugs. Um, and so I was taking Benadryl at the time and um, I had taken a Benadryl thinking that would help me, you know, kind of relax and zonk out. And it was probably, I'd say maybe half an hour, 45 minutes. And typically Benadryl hits me pretty quick and it just didn't do anything for me. So I had went to my prescription Ambien and I had been on Ambien for about a year uh, and a half or so um for a car accident that i was in and i had injured uh, my back and um i didn't take it regularly um i took it um you know probably maybe i say half a dozen times a month which we found out is actually the worst thing you can possibly do for ambien um is to take it you know not on a regular basis um and so it hit me and I fell asleep and I was actually watching duck dynasty at the time. And that was the stupidest show I've ever seen in my life. Um, but I still want to know what the ending was like. I still cannot find it on YouTube or anything, but I want to know the ending of the show. But, um, anyway, I fell asleep and the next thing I know, I woke up and I was in the hospital and it was three days later and the interactions that were portrayed by Metro to me, um, while I was in the hospital, uh, for me was just, uh, you know, I thought I was going to get punked. I thought uh, Ashley Kutcher was going to walk out of the curtain and, and tell me, you know, you, you, you know, you, here's the joke of your life. And for what the story that they had told me was that um, I was downstairs of my apartment complex and I was stopping vehicles from entering the complex. And one of the vehicles that entered the complex, um, I guess I had pulled my weapon out and he saw it. He backed up into a wall, uh, got out, ran across the street, and I fired my weapon at 136 feet into the grill of his car, all nine rounds. And um, 
there were two undercover. I don't want to say undercover because they they weren't undercover. They were uh, low profile. They were they're not wearing uniforms, but they were um, uh, on duty in a unmarked uh, police car, and they were at at that time, which was a Dottie's. Now it's a uh, what was it? A, a Joni's or something like that? I think uh, Nisa. Um, Dotties. At the time, it was, it was a Dotties. But, yeah. yeah, but uh, now it's something different. They heard the shots, and uh, without calling for backup, they actually drove around to, which was probably, I don't know, I'd say a couple thousand yards. It wasn't very far away. I mean, I can throw a rock at the at the at the complex next door, um, and they drove around and confronted me in front of the car that I had just shot. And when they pulled up, according to their story, was that I was stumbling around, and it appeared that I was intoxicated. And so they thought that I was the driver of that vehicle and that I was just in an accident. So they're, they're, and I still don't understand their thought, their thought process on it because they said they, they responded to shots fired. So when they came over and saw the accident, they came out of the vehicle to ask if I was okay. And when I, I guess had turned around the weapon was still in my hand, although it was unloaded um, with a slide lock back. And the officer that uh, contacted me, Officer Denton, which was the passenger side uh, officer, uh, became spooked and he retreated backwards and tripped over himself. And um, I'll, I'll go into that part in a second because first I want to say that he actually says that I fired at him first uh, five to seven times, and that's why they had to return fire. So, um, but the story was that he actually uh, tripped over himself, and when he landed on the ground, the gun went off and uh, shot a roundup in the tree. And so his partner, who heard the shot, turned and saw his partner on the ground, assumed that I'm the one who shot him, and then he started firing the rounds, and then between the two of them, 21 rounds later, they, they fired at me, striking me three times. And I ended up in the hospital for seven days on a ventilator for three days and in the ICU chained to my bed. And, and that's how you woke up. That's how I woke up. Yeah. It was a very, uh, if you've never woken up out of uh, anesthesia before, it's, uh, it's like, like, like waking up out of, out of a sleep, a deep sleep. And I woke up to, um, I remember them saying, uh, blow out, blow out, blow out, because I, they were pulling the tube out of my out of my throat. And I was kind of like looking around and everything was in a haze. I did see doctors and nurses. Um, and then I remember the, the chain on my foot. I had, I was chained to the bed and I, and I just, and, and I had this, the biggest pain. I mean, I, the worst pain of my life in my left arm. Uh, and I couldn't move it. And I was able to uh, move my right arm a lot and do the things that they wanted me to do, but the left arm was just not even, there was no use of it at all. And then I watched or looked over to my right and saw the, uh, the uniformed Metro, uh, uh, he was a uh, corrections officer. So he was one of the guys that worked in the jail who was uh, there to, to, uh, to watch me because at that time I was under arrest. And that's how so you're under. Yeah. So you're under arrest again. You, you have pretty, I mean, you've been, been out for a few days. You had absolutely no idea why you are where you are. And then how did they explain to you what had happened? Uh, I actually, it was funny because, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I had a lot of, uh, doctors and nurses come in and making snide comments to me. Um, for about a day or so about, you know, you don't remember anything, you know, you, you, you know what you did. Um, and they wouldn't let me watch the news. Uh, in fact, the TV was turned towards the officer so he can watch the TV. Um, so they wouldn't let me watch any of the news. So I really didn't know anything that what was going on. And the, the doctors and nurses kept making snide comments about me being uh, a cop killer and uh 
shooting at innocent people and shooting up neighborhoods. And I was just like, what the? And then it was the day, it was the, the morning, I think it was Monday or Tuesday or, or something like that, where uh, two detectives came in and they told me the story of, of what happened or what they thought the story was. And they were trying to get answers out of me, like, what, why did you do what you did? And I, I had no recollection whatsoever that I even did any of those things. And not only did I not have recollection, but the things they were telling me I did, I don't think I would ever have thought in my lifetime that I would ever have done those things because I spent my whole entire life doing the complete opposite, you know, uh, saving people's lives and, and doing things that, um, uh, made others, you know, enjoy their day better and, and ha- you know, live better instead. And so the things that they were telling me, I just, I, I just, I was in complete shock, you know, to even f- fire my weapon at anybody, uh, everybody who knows me from law enforcement officers to paramedics, to my, my friends and family know that my life would have had to be in, in jeopardy for me to fire my weapon, um, or somebody else's life would have to have been in jeopardy. So their original story was that I had fired at them a bunch of times and that was what the detectives were saying. And it took me a year and about a year until I went to my preliminary trial. And uh, this is when we found out that I never fired my weapon at the officers because the evidence was actually finally given to us. Um, the Metro CSI team uh, actually uh, canvassed the area, found no shell casings anywhere near where the officers that I encountered uh, were. And my shell casings were um, up the parking lot of the apartment complex, 13 parking spaces actually, which came out to 136 feet. Um, And so while we had the detective on the stand, we had got him to admit that I never fired at the officers and that the story that they had told was inaccurate. They didn't call it a lie or anything else. They just said that the story that they told was not matching the the evidence that was presented. And so is this before you, because I know you were in custody. I was reading um, about your your case and you were apparently in custody in county jail for for five years. Correct. Yes. So what was happening? You were just... You were fighting your case for five years in county jail. Could you explain that? Um, if anybody knows me, knows that I'm pretty stubborn um, and knows that. I guess I want to say that I knew I knew the side of law enforcement. I knew the side of EMS. I knew the side of, uh, you know, ballistics and and, you know, things like that. So. I started questioning things. And the more I questioned, uh, the more I spoke to my attorney on the phone or met with my attorney, the more the prosecution postponed my my case. And so um, I wasn't going to plead out to anything that they were, I mean, I think I was, I wanna say it was 17 uh, class B violent felonies that they had charged me with, three attempted murders, uh, three assault with the deadly weapons, the nine discharge of a firearms because they charged me for each round that I fired. Um, battery on the police officers. Yeah, there was 17 felonies and I can't remember all of them off the top of my head right now. Um, and they wanted me to play out and that would have been my life. It, it would have added up to a life sentence. And uh, you, in this state and a couple of other states, you have what they call general intent crimes and specific intent crimes. And a specific intent crime is something that you have to prove every element of the crime. Um, so like attempt to murder or murder, you have to prove that that person had every element of the crime to commit it. And with me being on Ambien, there's no way you can prove that I had intent to commit those crimes. Um, but the discharging of a firearm, on the other hand, is a general intent crime. So I would have been found guilty of that no matter what. 
um, because it just, it just, all he had to do is prove that I, I shot the gun. My fingerprints were on the gun. It was my gun. Um, and so it would have been, you know, uh, if I would have been convicted and I went to trial, it would have been a one to six for every uh, round that I fired. So nine to nine times, what was it? 56, nine to 56. And so I fought and fought and fought. And, you know, just the, it just, I, there was something that I had to find that could break the case, you know? And um, we ended up finding out about uh, David Denton's uh, DUI arrest that happened prior to my incident. And so my attorney at the time started questioning things, you know, were they intoxicated? You know, the fact that the officer tripped over himself and why was his finger on the trigger in the first place to pull the trigger when he fell to make the gun go off. Um, a lot of the other things when you in law enforcement that you have to do when you shoot uh, is know what is your backdrop and what's, you know, who's back there, you know, who are you shooting at? Um, There's a busy street that we were on a uh, very busy street. You know, we were in a grocery store complex right next door. Um, so I started questioning things and I just, I just kept going and kept going. And honestly, that five years, it went by pretty quick in my mind. Um, I didn't really think that I was in there for five years. And when I play it back in my mind now, I mean, I lost five years of my life with another seven months in prison, but, um, at the time I was fighting for my life. You know, and I knew because I would never have done the things that, you know, that they, they said that I, I did. And so what broke the case was David Denton got a second DUI arrest. Um, and that's basically what broke the case because now our questioning with them was, was he drunk when they shot me? Well, now he's got his two DUI arrests on the job, you know, and when I say on the job, he was in a police car, you know, the first one, he actually crashed his police car uh, mm -hmm. on Green Valley Ranch Road. And you can, you can actually Google it and, and find it. Um, the second one, he, he got stopped coming out of the headquarters building um, over there off of, uh, I think it's a ranch show or something like that, the main headquarters. And he got stopped by his own department and he got arrested. And, um, that's, and when I, and it was on the channel five news and I saw it and I called my mom right away. And I said, David Denton got arrested for again for a second DUI. And of course they monitored everybody's phone calls. And mine was very, very monitored by the prosecution. They knew that I knew it. And within two days, I had seven plea deals, uh, being offered to me, um, because they knew that we, they couldn't take it to trial, um, with the fact that they had an officer who just got fired for a second DUI. And so that would have just made the jury go, you know, are these officers out there drinking, you know, and doing their job, which now we know, you know, from other instances that they are, they, they do, you know, drink and drive and, and do other things, other types of illicit drugs. And that's not only that, but, you know, it's the, uh, you know, some of these guys are amped up on, on, you know, the chew and the, 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 all the, the, um, you know, the Red Bulls and the, and these, these drinks that are made to give you this energy, but it actually does things bad for you when you need to go into defensive mode and because it doesn't allow you to go that way. So a lot of these shootings, you know, and they, I know they've done studies on it. Um, that when you go into a, a stressful situation, having six or seven Red Bulls isn't going to allow you to, you know, anticipate what you need to um, and do the, do the actual, um, I, I don't know how you would say it, that do the actual thing that you should be doing and do it right because of the uh, chemicals that are in those Red Bulls. So you had already basically done five years in county jail. 
And then this officer gets arrested for his second DUI while on the job. And then you said the prosecutors came to you and they offered you deals. So tell me about the types of deals that they offered you. Um, the final deal that I actually got was called a, it's called a fictional plea. And the, what, the reason they call it a fictional plea is because it was charges that I was never actually charged with in the first place. And so what they had to do was because of the fact that they had to give me uh, a charge that would go with the time that I had already served. So it's really hard to come up with charges that I did with the time that I had already served. So they basically, you know, pretty much made up something. And um, they gave me a discharge of a firearm inside of a structure uh, with no violence and no victim was the actual uh, charge that I actually ended up with instead of shooting at an occupied vehicle and uh, shooting at um, the police officers and shooting at the, uh, the other individuals and stuff. So um, to come from that, you know, and I felt that that was appropriate because I took responsibility for my actions, you know, even though I don't feel that I was 100% responsible for my actions because of the Ambien, uh, I did in fact shoot my weapon that night and I can't, I can't not just say I'm going to walk away from this. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I, 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 I did what I did. So I felt that taking that responsibility was, was in my best interest. You don't ever remember discharging your gun at all that night. I don't remember a thing from going to sleep that night until I woke up the next, uh, what, three, three days later. Um, mm -hmm. I remember, I remember watching the duck dynasty and I, I, I was probably a good 10 minutes from the ending. Cause I really wanted to see the ending and I didn't make it. And then, which is kind of funny is I went to bed in, or I didn't go to bed. I was actually on the couch cause we didn't have a bed, a TV in the room. So I went to, I had uh, athletic shorts that I was wearing, no shirt and when I got up in the, what they call the, the ambient zombie effect, I got fully dressed. Uh, I actually loaded my duty weapon, um, put uh, shoes on and a jacket and actually went downstairs. And so I was doing some very complex things while under the influence of the ambient. And I don't remember any of it. And I actually unlocked my box that the gun was in so i had to find my keys and actually unlock the box that the gun was in so i was doing some very complex things but if you google some of the things that people have done i mean it's incredible some of the things that you know i mean if you can drive a car down the street you know i, I mean that's complex in itself without even being under ambient so um there's some there's been some pretty hor horrific things that have happened um, you know, just recently we had a mass shooting. We found out that the, the, one of the shooters was actually taking Ambien and using it to, um, they did the kind of what the, there's a school in Texas that was using it to, uh, for date rape drug, um, because the person is an amnesic, it's a hypnotic amnesic. So it makes you forget, but they, what they also do is the fraternities, what they'll do is they'll take six or seven pills and try to fight the effects of the Ambien. And so they party harder and do the things. And, and the first person who falls asleep is the person who gets the, the brunt of the, of the joke, I guess. But um, it's amazing what people can do or what they have done on, on Ambien. I mean, if you read some of this stuff, it's, it's pretty crazy that it hasn't been pulled off the market already. And, and the funny thing is, is that unless you're seen by somebody doing it, you don't know what's going on. So how many people have had this happen to them that have been by themselves? You know what I'm saying? So we know for a fact that, um, you know, somebody like in the middle of the night got hungry. So they get up in the middle of the night, go put a, a pizza in the oven, um, but forget to take it out of the box. So the kitchen burns down. 
Mm-hmm. So we find out that, you know, that kind of stuff happens. But, you know, if you, you know, and I've heard other stories of, of things like that, but unless you're seen by somebody or something like that happens, we really don't have any idea of how many incidences really happen on, on these, um, these sedative hypnotics that are out. I mean, it's, it's kind of scary. It's, it really is scary. And so you were offered a deal, you took the deal, and you did seven months in prison. Yes. I, um, I was supposed to – the deal that I got was that I had time served. Um, I had actually one year more than my time was served. So I was supposed to go up to um, – the way it works is if you are convicted of a felony, you have to go to prison to get a prison number. Um, so you go up to the fish tank, and I was supposed to be immediately really released. Uh, upon finding housing, I had housing uh, um, set aside, but because of the functionality of our our state's uh, parole and probation, it took them seven months to check out my housing. So I sat in uh, prison for seven months waiting to get out. Hmm. And so you did the seven months, even though you weren't supposed to do any time up there. Then what? Then I went on parole. (laughs) Uh, And I'm still on parole. Um, I'm actually on parole until November. So the actual, um, I want to say it was a 4 to 16, I think it was, um, was the actual conviction conviction. Day, uh, time. So my parole is up in November of this year. So that would be my, my end date. Uh, and I'll be free to, to roam and, and free to do what I need to do until hopefully crossing my fingers. I cross my fingers, but I'm holding the phone. Um, I can get a pardon from the state. And that's the biggest thing that I'm working on right now with, uh, with help from several very, very incredible people that have bent over backwards for me. Uh, one of them being Senator Parks, uh, my lawyer, Lisa Rasmussen, and uh, a couple of others, uh, Nisa. I mean, uh, just the, the amazing things that she's done. Um, so uh, I'm, that's what I'm, that's my biggest goal right now is to get a pardon and get this overturned so that I can go back to my life again. Because right now I, I, I am not able to do anything that even remotely close to what I was able to do before, you know, and that was save lives, you know, and, and do what I think my, my job on earth was put here for was to save other people and help other people and animals. You were in custody and County jail for five years. Then you were in prison for seven months. You got out, you're still on parole. What was your life or what has your life been like? after all of this? Um, it took me about three months or so to get acclimated once I got out. And when I say acclimated, um, just the, the, the colors, because inside of jail, inside of prison, it's one color, it's white. Um, and then the doors are maybe may gray, if that, but that would be the only color. So to get used to colors again was was a big deal for me. Getting used to driving again, I got motion sickness, you know, for the first couple of months. Um, just being around other people, um, being in crowds, you know, having people around you. Uh, because when, you, when you're in jail and prison, you go into a pr- protective mode. Um, you have to... Um, I don't want to say you, you have to be ready to fight at all times uh, because anything could break out and you could be the one person that they pick, you know, that they want to go after. Um, so you have to be in that, that protective mode at all times. You're always watching your back, always watching what's going on, always watching who's, and you can pick out the tension in the room. And, and you just, and I became very good at, you know, picking up, there's a lot of tension going on. I'm going to go over to my bunk and hide, you know, cause this, something's going to happen. And you just know it. So it took me a while to do that. Um, the next thing that was really hard was eating food again, eating real food, um, 
you know, I, I, I was always, you know, had stomach issues um, because jail food for the most part is, is pig slop. I mean, it's really what it is. It's, it's just, it's, uh, it's mostly soy um, based, which I think needs to, yeah, I think you like soy, don't you? Um, but uh, it's just disgusting. It's just a horrible, horrible nutritional value that they give you. Uh, and then you have to check in uh, uh, once a month with your parole officer and then you're monitored by parole and probation. And so they can come to your house anytime they want. Um, they can stop you at any time they want. They can do pretty much whatever they feel they justified, um, including the local police. You have to register where you live with the local police department. And then they can also come to your house anytime they want. So like, um, say my crime was if I had something other than the discharge and firearm, let's say like I had a burglary charge and a burglary went on down the street. Well, now they know that I'm registered and I had a burglary charge. They can come to my house and question whether or not I was involved in the burglary. So that, that's why that's one of the reasons why you register. So um, for the first, I'd say six months, I was uh Watched pretty closely by PNP, uh, parole and probation. But after that, they started learning who I was as a person, learning the case itself, and learning that it was BS, you know. And I started getting trusted a lot more. Um, I didn't have to worry about checking in as much. Um, we're about to get invaded by the cats. Um, the, uh, the, you know, they knew being a paramedic, you know, doing the job, you know, I was teaching at school. I was, I was doing uh, some movie work and, um, oh, that was the other thing, getting a job, um, as a felon. Uh, it took me three years to find an actual full-time job in my field, three years. Um, I had little side gigs here and there that would just help me with money. Um, but it really took, it took the stars to align right to give me this job. Um, it, uh, and then to kind of have it all shut down with COVID really sucks. But um, uh, yeah, it, that, that's really hard to do. It's it, getting a job in your field. It, it just, it sucks. Uh, getting a place to live, you know, I, I'm not allowed to just freely move around anytime I want to. I have to get permission. Um, from PMP if I want to move. Um, I even have to get permission if I want to apply for a job um, because they could, certain certain um, cases could um, not allow you to work in certain areas. Say if you were a child molester, you can't work near a school, things like that. So I have to make sure that PMP is, is knowledgeable of the jobs that I'm applying for. Um, now I have a pretty good, uh, pretty cool PO um, the last couple actually have been really cool. They, they know they, you know, do what you need to do. You know, we, you know, if you want to go work a movie, go do this, go do that. They, they've been really cool. The last one, I'm actually having more issues with Metro than I'm having with, um, PMP. And when I say issues, um, the unit that the two officers belong to, uh, was called the PSU or the problem solving unit. It was a little side division uh, or unit put together, kind of like the uh, old LAPD crash back in the old uh, 80s. And they're a unit of uh, non-uniformed officers. And, and basically, they go to the more serious crimes that are occurring, uh, gang, gang issues, um, shootings, things like that. They kind of just go on their own. They're not dispatched. They don't have to tell the dispatch where they are or anything like that. They just kind of roam the city and just do they, what they want. Um, I have been getting harassed uh, pretty continuously. In fact, the latest one was about, uh, I'd say three weeks now, where the issue that came about were that two officers were actually inside my complex, my apartment complex where I live now, and I didn't even pay any attention because I thought I was safe in my complex. And as I was walking down the walkway to get to my building, 
they said, hey, you, or it was, uh, hey, what's up, or something to that effect. And I turned around and I had guns pointed at me. And the, the comment was, if you touch your camera, we'll shoot. Um, because I've been carrying a body camera around with me. Um, and I've been carrying it around for a little over a year now because of the harassment. Um, my feeling, as well as my lawyer's feeling is, is that if this does go in front of the pardon board, you're going to have people ask questions. And, you know, for the most part, this was swept under the rug. You know, I, I took the felony. I went to prison. Um, the two officers were awarded Medal of Valors for their, their tremendous work that night on November 3rd, 2012. And um, it was swept under the rug. It was made to look like Metro did a, a phenomenal job. And so with this going to go in front of seven judges and the governor, um, there's going to be questions asked, you know, and I have all my evidence. I have the paperwork that shows that I didn't do the things that they're saying that I did. You know, I have all these paperwork, you know, that they're going to have to ask, answer to. And so when the judge asks, why did this happen or why didn't this happen? I can say, well, here's, here's the evidence. Here's my paperwork that shows that it did or didn't happen. And I think they're nervous. I think they're scared. And so the harassment that I've been getting has been watch my back, uh, stop my process of the pardon. Um, you know, just basically it's just, you know, more and more watch your back. And so it was my very first body camera that I got. It was a little, a uh, little pin, little type body camera that I, I had. And the first interaction I had, the officer actually took it from me, erased the footage. And after he was done with the harassment, he gave me back my camera. And so I felt, what use is it to have a body camera that you can't, you know, um, keep the footage if, um, you know, what uses it? So like with a police department, their stuff's backed up to a hardware, uh, some sort of, um, drive unit so that, you know, well, their stuff disappears a lot, but anyway, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so I needed to find a camera that would uh, save my information without them being allowed to erase it. And I did a lot of research and I found a law enforcement actual camera that does save the information to the camera, but it actually downloads it to my phone and then downloads to the cloud. So they can actually take my camera take it all they want, but it's on my phone. They can take my phone all they want, but it's on the cloud and they can't get to my cloud. So, um, in fact, uh, Forestry Directory Project uh, just got a grant to do the same thing with, with cameras and we've um, distributed the cameras to certain people and um, that are having some issues and it's the same system that, that I have and the camera works great and it does what it does and that's one of the reasons why I had guns pointed at me this time, because they knew that if I pushed the button, there was no way that they could have erased the footage and they know. So now I have to walk, walk around now with the camera on at all times instead of being able to push the button when the camera, you know, to activate the camera when an event happens. So um, that's been going on since I've been out. But for the most part, it's, it's just been, you know, I mean, it's living in Vegas. It's um, now we're in the middle of Corona, so that's a whole other issue. But, you know, finding a job, watching my back from these officers and, um, you know, just trying to lay low. I, you know, I mean, it's it's a whole different world. It's it's not like what I used to, where I used to be out, you know, the sirens go by every day and it's, it, it bums me out because I, I can't do that anymore, or at least right now until I, I get the pardon. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I get job offers all the time um, because of the teaching that I do at the school, at a school, I, I teach at the EMS training center and I teach a lot of the, the supervisors and the, the chiefs and stuff. And they're like, why don't you come work for me? Why don't you come work for me? And I don't, or try not to tell them my, my side of the story because I don't want it to get out. But there is a lot of people, I, I mean, this is a small community and a lot of people know about my story. So when the Southern Nevada Health District found out about it, they took my license away from me. So now it limits my job even more. Um, 
So now I'm fighting to get that back um, through help from uh, Commissioner Tip Siegerblum. Um, so he and Senator Parks are helping me try to get my license back so that I can actually go and work at other jobs. So it, it's, it's been a, it's been a, it's just a fight just to, to stay living, you know what I mean? Just to, to uh, be able to make money um, and feel like society. That's, that's the biggest thing because they don't want you to be a projective member of society. They don't want you to, it's, it's made to, the system is made to um, break you. It's made to uh, go against you and it's made to make you feel like you are nothing. And I think they're very upset that I've accomplished what I've accomplished in the time that I've been out. I think that they are upset that I haven't been um, returned back to prison. You know, I, I broke the stereotype. Um, so I'm hoping that the pardon board sees it and I can go on with my life. Having been a part of law enforcement, and I want to bring you in in just a second, Nisa, but I, I have one question I want to ask Terry really quickly. Having been a part of law enforcement prior to all of this, what is your perspective now that you've had to experience something such as what you've gone through since 2012? Huh. Um, it's funny because, you know, I go through the same training that every law enforcement officer goes through. Um, everybody goes through the same type of law enforcement academy, except we go through an added uh, land management um, portion to our law enforcement, uh, general law enforcement academy. Um, but in my role as a park ranger with the National Park Service, we're not a city agency where we are hands are on our guns at all times and we're in the ready and we're, you know, we're ready to, to take down the bad guys at all times, even though we have to have that mentality because, I mean, let's face it, we've found some of the top 10 most wanted uh, FBI guys in the national parks hiding. So um, we have rapes, murders, you know, crimes like that happen in national parks all the time. So we, we just have a different mindset. Um, we're more of a, this is your park, come visit. Um, and then if you have transition into the law enforcement role, you transition into that role, but you transition into what's appropriate. We're not trained to go straight for our gun and ask questions later. You know, we can escalate our force. We're trained to escalate and de-escalate. And, uh, you know, we've been wearing body cameras for a while. Um, you know, we've had tasers for a lot longer than most departments. Um, so I think that my mindset, my mindset has always been different from the average, uh, city cop. And, um, now that I see what I've seen, um, I guess I can say that I wish I would have seen it before I started in law enforcement because it would have changed my mindset even more. But I still love being a park ranger. I really, really, truly love being a park ranger because it's not just being law enforcement. You are a paramedic. You're a firefighter. You're an interp ranger. You go educate about the trees. You go deal with animal issues constantly. Um, you do search and rescue. Uh, you do uh, school fodder rescue in the rivers. I mean, there's so many different things your hat wears in the park service that it is truly one of the best jobs jobs that I've ever had. And um, I honestly would still to this day go back to it because um, it's just it's not it's not just a law enforcement job. You know, more more of anything is interpretation. We, we did a lot of education, even if my traffic stops. I even have a letter from a lady that uh, wrote me to thank her for giving her a ticket because it saved her life later down the road um, because she ran into a large herd of elk and because she was going slower, it saved her life. And that's what our jobs were, were education. And, and, um, and so I don't think that traditionally our type of law enforcement is the same as say a city cop like Metro or 
Henderson or anything like that. So it's, it's different. It, I definitely have a, a different perspective, but it's, it's always been that way since even before I became, because I actually was a reserve deputy sheriff for Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department doing search and rescue as well. So I had some of that law enforcement training as well. And, um, but I've always had that mentality of search and rescue. I didn't have the mentality of, of, you know, being a police officer in a black and white, you know, responding to, you know, domestic violences and gang, you know, gang stuff and stuff like that. So, you know, again, a different mentality, but still kind of the same mentality of the way I think about law enforcement in, in my side, the side out here, what I've seen here, this is the wild west. I mean, this is crazy. I would never, ever, ever in my lifetime want to become a Metro officer. Hmm. Nisa Sun is with Force Trajectory Project. And Nisa, what's your perspective on all of this? Um, Terry's story is, is really unique in that, you know, he was, the well, first he's, um, first I just want to acknowledge Terry is a hero. We're, we're, <laughs> we should all be honored to have this man on, you know, be able to listen to his story. But I mean, this man has saved whales. He's, you know, he saved a lot of human beings um, in his past. Um, he's really a phenomenal person. He's the kind of person that you would want to be, you would want to be present if you were in some kind of life, uh, if your life was endangered in some way, or if, if one of your family members um, fell ill or was in an accident, um, Terry's the kind of person that would run in and know exactly what to do and save that person's life. Um, you know, he has an a, incredible track record. Um, you know, we, I spent, gosh, me and Terry worked together for probably six months, uh, trying to piece together his story because it is very complex. And one of the first episode or the third episode of Residuum, which is our docu-series, uh, focused on Las Vegas police violence. Um, the third and fourth episode are, are Terry's story, literally. And um, the first uh, episode really explains and breaks down the ambient effect that uh, is what caused you know, him to act irrationally uh, without any recollection uh, that night. And uh, we had to do a lot of research and find an interview uh, people who have been impacted by Ambien also. Um, and, you know, people just don't understand that, you know, Ambien one is a, is a very dangerous pharmaceutical drug that definitely should not be on the market. Um, it, the company itself is, is very powerful. Uh, you can't even hashtag Ambien on Instagram because um, they won't allow it. You know, they have some kind of deal with Instagram where you can't even make it a hashtag. Um, so, you know, Terry is a victim of not only uh, police br brutality and corruption, he's also a, a victim of mass incarceration and being wrongfully accused and wrongfully arrested and wrongfully incarcerated. And he's also a victim of big pharma. Um, you know, it, it's like we recently saw the, uh, uh, the opioid crisis uh, conclude in that class action lawsuit. Um, and really it's time for, you know, ambient victims to come together also to uh, put an end to this crazy drug that people shouldn't be taking. The um, one of the uh, CEOs of Hard Rock Hotel, uh, he a few years ago killed himself while on under the influence of Ambien. And we have, uh, you know, high profile people like Forty Five and his administration giving out Ambien to his uh, administration like candy, uh, and also uh, in the past, um, who else has been on Ambien? Tiger Woods. Um, and, uh, Nicole, Anna Nicole Smith, I think she died on Ambien. Heath Ledger, uh, died, uh, when he was, you know, he, uh, overdosed on a bunch of different kinds of drugs and also Ambien. Um, it's a very problematic drug. So that f third episode is dedicated to breaking down Ambien. We have, uh, a colleague of mine and friend, Christina Boyce, who's a registered nurse, uh, talk about it and talk about the effects of Ambien. And then the second episode is dedicated to explaining what happened that night um, that Terry ended up becoming, you know, influenced by Ambien and shooting up this car. 
Um, but, you know, all the evidence is there. You know, he he was having clearly a, a medical emergency. The officers came on scene, shot at him at point blank range, 21 shots. Miraculously, he survived only getting shot three times, um, which tells me that it's likely that these officers were intoxicated because they shot him at point blank range, yet they only hit him three times out of 21 rounds. Um, and, you know, another thing that is, is critical in Terry's case, uh, which was brought up this summer uh, during the second legislative session um, with the passing of AB3, uh, which is a p police accountability bill, um, addresses uh, the fact that um, officers after using force don't get alcohol and drug tested. So AB3 actually mandates officers to be uh, tested for drugs and alcohol. And I do believe that if Terry's case happened you know, after the passing of AB3, um, they would have found that these officers were intoxicated. So, you know, it's it's just, it's really crazy and unfortunate what's happened to Terry. I fully support his pardon. Um, you know, we do have, we have been pushing his petition. Um, I'll definitely leave it in the comments after this uh, live session is over. Um, but yeah, no, I, I feel very, very, uh, I feel very sorry for Terry because, you know, th this, he, again, he's a hero. He's somebody who right now, if he was pardoned, could be saving lives. Um, and he, he's very passionate about doing that. So, you know, I commend, I commend Terry for his, his, uh, his bravery and courage because the fact that the police have been intimidating him constantly since he, he's been out is just absolutely disgusting and needs to be known in the public, in my opinion. And Terry, you've gone through basically about the worst case scenario that a person can go through on so many levels. Having gone through this, these experiences, what do you want to see come out of all of this that could help someone else who might also encounter the worst case scenario like you did? The, the, the legislature Legislators need to become more aware of what's going on. And I think, thankfully, obviously there was more instances that we didn't know about the reason why AB3 was passed. Um, so these kind of things need to be brought out in the spotlight, you know, and legislation needs to be passed. And I think I would really love, you know, Big Pharma to, to have some issues in this too, but I, I know that's never going to happen because of the billions and billions of dollars that they make, you know, and pay off legislators, you know, up in Washington. But I, I really think that education is the biggest key to this. And that's one of the reasons why I do what I do with, with NISA is that I can help educate others. I can help people that are involved in these kind of situations, you know, um, you know, people that have just got out of jail, you know, I know how that is. I know the effects of that. Um, even right now, one of our families is having some issues with one of the family members. And, you know, we've had to kind of continuously deal with it. And, you know, I, I'm able to intercede on, in that kind of, so education, I think is the biggest key that I can, I can do right now. Um, but, and tell our legislators actually grow up here and actually start doing things to go up against some of these police departments. And, and also it's not actually just the police departments. It's actually the, the, the unions that protect the police departments. Uh, Metro's police protective association is one of the most powerful in the nation. And they, they run Metro. Nothing gets, nothing gets done in Metro without the, the union doing things. So I'm sure they're probably spinning on their chairs right now with the pass of AB3. Um, but I think we need to start looking at some of that kind of stuff too, as well as, is is take a look and find out exactly how much authority they should have in a police department. And then I think the biggest thing that I'd like to see is some sort of overwatch over police departments. 
because um, right now police police themselves and until we find out you know and, and i'm not going to say that i wasn't involved in some instances where you know my partner would say you didn't see that or that didn't happen or you know because it, it does it happens it's it's a brotherhood and you somebody's at my door and i'm hoping it's not my po um let me go just to make sure um but it's it's a brotherhood and you have to give me one second i'm sorry hi okay can i'm on the phone on a conference call zoom can i come back later i'm gonna leave you this sheet of paper oh. Okay. About two minutes. Okay. All right. Or half a minute. Okay. And you can go online or you can go to okay. You have two days. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. All righty. Well, I thought it was my PO, but thank God it wasn't. Um. So. Back to what I was saying is an overwatch. You know, the police police themselves, and that, it, to me, is, is dangerous. And, and we need some sort of, of oversight, whether it's civilian, uh, whether it's a federal non-law enforcement um, oversight. Um, you know, even some of these nonprofits, you know, force directory would be a great oversight. You know, I mean, we've done some great things with uncovering some things that have gone on in Metro. And, um, I, you know, I think that um, that's the biggest thing that I think, in my opinion, needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in working with people like uh, Terry, Misa, um, and we talk about this often, when we do these interviews about every situation is different. Um, and yet there are a lot of common patterns that we see in terms of, uh, of police brutality or police uh, misconduct. And with someone like Terry, you know, what is the, how are you able to help him get on the path to be able to fulfill what it is that he wants to accomplish along with helping you to fulfill the overall mission of improving people's lives by uh, basically asking law enforcement to be more accountable for the things that they're doing? Um, I mean, I think for us, it, it's really it's really about one, it's about amp being able to tell their story in a way that makes sense. Like for example, Terry's story is very multi-layered, you know? And so again, it took months to figure out how to uh, put the story together in a way that the public would be able to digest it and understand um, all of the layers that it entails. Um, so, you know, the first part of it was really about, well, absolutely, the first part of it is about consent. It's about, you know, where where is the, the survivor or the victim at in regards to their case? Are they able to, would telling their story and amplifying their voice uh, be helpful uh, in their situation? Because um, there are a lot of people that, you know, I mean, again, every case is different. You know, some cases um, families were uh, tricked into signing a gag order um, until their case is closed and they can't disclose any details because they signed something and they didn't even know about it. Um, so in particular, Terry's case, uh, it was really important to strategize with him and understand uh, what it is that he's trying to do, which is to get this pardon so that he can return to his life of you know, being a paramedic or a park ranger um, or, a, or a medic or search and rescue, whatever it is that he decides to do, um, and uh, make sure that we have all the pieces in place. So we do have a petition um, to demand the pardon for Terry. Um, and, you know, of course, we have the two episodes that feature him um, that we hope that people will take the time to, to watch. Um, and, you know, we have partnered with, you know, different uh, platforms like yourself and also Community Change, which is a national platform out of DC uh, that I, I do, I produce videos for. And so, you know, with the help of, of, you know, the grassroots community and also larger community organizations, um, we're hoping that 
telling these stories like Terry's will begin to open the eyes of people and hearts and minds of people, um, especially those in influence who have who have influence in, in decision making. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did. And uh, Terry, we really appreciate you taking the time to stop by and tell your story and um, wish you success as you continue to work towards your pardon and living, getting back into what you have a true passion for, which is helping people. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You know, it's funny. I, I wanted to say something before. <clears throat> I've, I've never been the type of person to be in the spotlight, you know, and, and Nisa can tell you that doing the the, the two episodes of Residuum was was hard for me because I'm not the type of person to be in front of the camera. Um, I was never really a kind of guy that like to get awards, you know, and I, I don't feel I'm a hero by any means. You know, I'm just an ordinary person that loves to do my job. <laughs> and luckily through the awards that I was able to save, and I wanted to, I don't know if I, you can see this or not, but this is, a volunteer of the year award that I received. This is the kind of person that I, I was or is still am. Mm -hmm. And then I also have a life-saving award for actually saving somebody's life. I was awarded life-saving award for the year. And these are the kind of things that, that mm. the pardon board is going to see, you know, and this is the kind of things that the people are going to see that, you know, Metro did this to somebody and it wasn't just, um, you know, some random person, you know, this was somebody that is, is capable of saving somebody's life, you know, and they need to understand that there's some questions that are unanswered and, and uh, I'm hoping that the, there isn't a black cat that runs in front of the, the, the pardon board's way that day, but um, I, I just, I hope to God that, you know, that I get a pardon. I really do. Because I would, I would wish, like to continue doing my work. We're going to wish that you pitch the lucky the lucky horseshoe instead, right, of the black cat. <laughs> Thanks but again yeah, for being I, a part of the I, show. I think I, I thank Nisa so much. And I thank you so much for allowing me to come on. Um, and if you guys out there, um, you know, please look at the, at the residual video. Look at the FTP website. And, you know, come help and, and be a part of what we do. I mean, this is, this is huge to be able to help people who go through these traumatic experiences and have to deal with life changing, um, you know, losing a loved one is, is, is hard, you know, and to have to do it in the manner that, you know, like with Jesus talked about earlier in the week, you know, it's, this is difficult. This is not an easy thing to deal with. And, when you have a department like Metro breathing down your neck, um, it's, it, it's, your life is, is not the same. It's difficult. And I think that, uh, you know, people don't understand that. So that's why I definitely implore you to come out and, and see what we do and see what it's like to be with a family member who's lost somebody and to speak to some of the survivors, you know, one of our survivors, Christina, who has the, the, the burns that she has, I, I just, I, you know, I, I look at her and I cry, I cry. you know, um, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's hard to see. It's even in my job that I've done for so long to see some of these people with these, to deal with these issues. So thank you again for letting me come on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, Nisa, thank you. You are the best. Thanks, Terry. And as always, Lisa, I appreciate having Force Trajectory Project as a part of these broadcasts. I know that we have other broadcasts coming up in the future where we'll be talking with people. And um, there was a good point that you made when you were speaking just a minute ago. And you were talking about the fact that there are so many layers in every story, in every situation uh, that comes up in life. And that's part of what Voices of Humanity is all about. It's about expressing the different layers for all of those out there of you who want to look for more information than maybe you're getting at the surface when you, you watch traditional television. There's a story that's being told there, but understand that there's always a lot more to those stories than are being told in these sound bites and these uh, very short-lived 
news cycles that you experience usually with traditional media. And that is what the Voices of Humanity show is all about in this partnership that we have with the Force Trajectory Project. It is about starting to unravel some of the layers of these popular stories. There are probably many of you who've heard about Terry's story. And we hope that by allowing him to talk today, that you'll have a greater understanding of the man, of the situation, and that some of the circumstances that are happening within police departments, not just here in Las Vegas with Metro, but all around the country and around the world for that matter, and that these issues need to be addressed as so many other issues that involve humanity need to be addressed. And we're going to be expressing uh, with these shows that we have here at PRConnectionsRadio.com. So take care of yourselves and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next broadcast. Great. Thank you, Guy. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm.